sponsored by the Securities and Exchange Commission of Nigeria. Welcome back. You're watching a special broadcast. We're coming to you live from Abuja, Nigeria, under the auspices of the Securities and Exchange Commission. What you're watching right now is the regulators panel, just talking about what's needed by way of cooperative and collaborative regulation. That's the theme, the key to market integrity. I think for me, that's the underscore market integrity in Africa. Before the break, we were talking about various efforts at cooperation. Arun Mote, she's the Director General of the SEC in Nigeria. We've heard from Stella Kilonzo in terms of the memoranda of understanding that she signed with various uh, uh, regulators in Africa on your side? Uh, we're all members of the Africa Middle East Regional Committee of IOSCO and what we're doing is working together uh, to see how we can ensure uh, that together that we abide by the 38 principles of securities regulation. Norman Muller had made the point about the fact that market conduct regulators must pay attention to issues of systemic risk we also believe that investor education, uh, given uh, the nature of our markets, is extremely important. And so recently, uh, we did have an interaction amongst ourselves on issues around investor education, given that a number of the population uh, in Africa yeah. still don't have access to capital market products or to the banking sector. Locally, um, it is extremely important to us and as a key response to the global financial crisis. We work very closely with the other regulators, certainly to ensure that there's no regulatory arbitrage. But I do think that the central bank governor, who's the chair of our committee, can uh, make some additional comments about that area. Well, I mean, as a woman said, we've got an institutional framework here for coordination, which wasn't very effective until about two years ago, is the Financial Sector Regulation Coordinating Commission, which uh, committee which I chair. And basically, it brings together SEC, um, um, the central bank, PENCOM, NICOM, um, and we do have a number of observer regulators, including the Nigerian Accounting Standard Board, um, the FIRS. Um, and we basically um, try to shut the door um, in the face of regulatory arbitrage. And we do recognize that a lot of what happened in the banking system, for example, happened through the capital markets. And therefore, there's no point fixing the banks if the capital market is not fixed. And a lot of the work that's happened in SEC with the investigation of the IST, for example, um, was basically joint efforts, okay, central bank, NDIC, and SEC, and the, um, uh, and the law enforcement agents, uh, new regulations around margin lending and capital markets. Um, and for us in the central bank, uh, we do have cross-border um, arrangements now with the central banks. Uh, we, for instance, um, Spearhead is setting up in the West African Monetary Zone a college of supervisors uh, that brings together the directors of banking supervision in central banks in the Wamsi region. Uh, we're now extending that to the Francophone West African region and I have put on the table as a proposal with African central banks that we do have an African college of supervisors. And it's important for us because Nigerian banks have expanded into other African countries. We now send our supervisors to places like Zambia, for example, and Ghana, and they join central bank supervisors in conducting joint supervision exercises and reports. So um, there has been a, a greater cooperation across um, borders among central banks and also within the Nigerian border among regulatory agencies. I know that the history you know, is the past, but I'd like us to just delve a little bit into the past. And um, when we talk about cleaning up, the Nigerian system. You know, you use the word arbitrage. Let's talk about the role of the banks, who to a large extent are the drivers of Nigeria's uh, capital markets, and how the banks got bitten by the loans incurred in the petroleum sector. And those being bad loans then effectively created a bit of a crisis for the banks, and so on and so forth. You need to have a system where the banks are better monitored, and you've been very active in that sense, you know. Um, we need to have a system where the driver of the Nigerian economy, which for the moment is the capital, is the uh, petroleum sector, increasingly the agricultural sector, that their linkages to financial flow do not create an impasse, the kind of crisis that we saw before. Well, you know, um, although I missed the last bit of the question, uh, what was the, the last bit you said? I just want to know what it is you're doing to really clean up the system, because it's, a, it's almost an incestuous relationship how money flows in Nigeria to the key sectors of the economy. Okay, well the cleanup has been going on for a long time and I think um, if you look at what's happening with Wall Street for example, uh, the, the real issue is not so much that banks were bailed out and people understand that some banks are too big to fail. 
The real issue is that in the West, um, a lot of the people who were responsible for the mess were not brought to book, and people did not take responsibility. Uh, what we've said in Nigeria is that we do accept that banks can be too big to fail, but we do not accept that bankers are too big to jail, and that's, and that, and that's a major difference. Um, so. Um, what we've done is to say those who were responsible for what happened have to be held to account, and that is a major part um, of what has changed. Uh, the second thing that's changed, I think, is um, we have devised a method for making sure that the banking industry itself is responsible for bearing the bulk of the cost of the bailout. So the industry understands that going forward, if um, the banks take unnecessary risks, the taxpayer is not going to come and bail out the industry the bank's profits for the next 10 years are going to be used um, to, uh, to pay back this, uh, the cost of the cleanup. But now, um, obviously, um, this is an ongoing process. Uh, it's not just the banking industry. Within the central bank itself, there were failures of regulation, there are failures of supervision. There's a question of skills gaps. There's a question of um, risk-based supervision. What is soft, soft touch regulation or, light, or, or, or uh, um, closed, um, uh, cl closed regulation? And of course, things like regulatory arbitrage and greater coordination with other parties. I, I do think b before 2009, if there had been more attention paid to signals, say, coming from NDIC and SEC, the central bank would have acted much faster. And, and I think this um, um, closer collaboration means um, a lot of the information that Aruma had, for instance, came from central bank examination reports. And we just traced the money from the banks through to the capital market and were able to see all the insider related transactions and frauds. But some are saying, you know, for any foreign investor coming into any market, anywhere, they look at a variety of variables, you know, the extent to which the government is indebted, the stability of the currency, um, the diversity of products on the boards, all of those kinds of things. Now, you've been fighting tooth and nail to keep this Naira stable. I don't think you're winning. The truth is, we, we did have in the last uh, few weeks um, a period where all currencies went through a crisis. I mean, the, the South African rand lost 16%, and the Kenyan shilling lost 25%. Um, the Malaysia ringgit, the uh, Chinese renminbi, the euro, every currency in the world was hit. Um, the Naira lost, what, 3, 4, 5%, and the whole world is screaming. Um, we, um, we, 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 did, we did breach a band, okay? Um, we never said we had a fixed rate. What we said was that we're going to have a stable rate. Okay, now if you come in at, I don't care if it's 155 or 160 or 165, frankly, it's not important. But a foreign investor who changes dollars or euro or RMB into Naira to purchase Nigerian fixed income getting 15% wants to know that in three months, the Naira is not going to have lost 10, 15%. Okay, nobody wants to have all the gains on fixed income or on equities wiped out by exchange rate losses. Um, so what we have tried to do in the central bank is to provide people with an anchor for expectations so people can be able to say that their currency risk is being properly managed. And so long as we're not running reserves at an outrageous rate, we'll try to give that stability. We think at this point we might move to 155, 156 as a midpoint. Uh, we might tell people we're going to move between 153 and 158. It should be very clear. We'll come out with a stance. People know that over the next 12 months, they can expect the central bank to keep the narrow within that band, and then they can take other risks into consideration. I'd like your comments on this one, to the extent that there's a lot of pressure right now, I would say, on you to help sustain this market. 47% of investments in Nigerian securities. It's a good showing, but to a large extent, it really means that the successes, at least in the interim, of the Nigerian capital markets depend on your participation. Even after the 2008 crisis, uh, pension funds did not move out of the capital market. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, we, we, we have one major issue, and the issue that we must return positive uh, returns to, to the investors. And given the fact that this is a new scheme, uh, the slightest movement uh, in returns uh, will create serious uh, confidence. And as far as we are concerned, if there are good instruments, I can assure you that pension assets would be invested in. But beyond that, of course, is the fact that uh, inflation is an issue, and that's why we're very happy with the monetary policy. As long-term investors are concerned is inflation. If inflation cannot be tamed, obviously the savings that are going to be made over the years will be wiped off. And we are pleased to note that, uh, of course, other people will argue that cost of funds have gone up. Uh, but as institutional investors, we believe what central bank is doing is in the right direction. We know that recently we've seen bonds uh, trading in the region of 18%. So things, things are, are, are looking a lot better. But as you're saying, inflation is something to concern yourself with. And also, what we term unbridled government spending, that's going to continue to be a risk. 
Well, I, I hope and I pray, and given the new structure we have in place in terms of economic management, uh, fiscal policy would be uh, quite responsible, and uh, hopefully it will also be synchronized with monetary policy. And to that extent, uh, some of the expenses we've had in the past uh, would, would, uh, would be minimized. And if they be minimized, obviously, even in terms of infrastructure development, would see things to come. But beyond that, of course, is the fact that uh, we've been talking about one issue, and I believe uh, the DJ had also mentioned that in a speech. Uh, the big names are out of the capital market. How do you bring them on board? And I think this is the issue. We've looked at carrot and stick uh, approach. Uh, we've also looked at mandatory uh, policies, but we need to find a way of bringing them on board. Uh, pension assets can be invested only in good quality uh, instruments, and hopefully uh, we pray that uh, this will come very soon. It's not just the Naira that's taken a beating. The Kenyan shilling's taken a massive beating, over 26% of its value lost this year alone. And what that's done is a situation where equity seriously devalued, fixed income seriously devalued. People don't want to touch Kenya with a stick. What are you doing about that? What, uh, what was done recently was really a monetary policy where the interest rates were raised up by the central bank governor as well as uh, obviously the Ministry of Finance that has stabilized because I think the issue is about reducing volatility. It's about um, certainty and that, that's what was happening and that uh, has now brought in some stability. We've seen um, you know, a return to bonds trading. Um, what else is being done in the medium to long term is really to increase bond uh, post trade transparency because the issue is what data is available um, and that is something that we have been working on uh, with the stock exchange as well as the bond traders association to try and just get the data out there um, the other issues obviously are um, in terms of just um, you know trying to again talk to the pensions regulator as well as just the pension trustees in terms of what what can they do to actually um, invest in our market because uh, how do some of the policies that have been uh, made on the other hand affect the capital markets uh, what uh, what was a win recently was the national social and security fund in kenya it actually signed up with our fund managers about six licensed fund managers of our capital markets and and based on that, um, they are now getting professional advice and they are able to actually, um, you know, undertake um, purchases is both in equities as well as bonds. I think what I, why I want to stress that is because, because of the contagion and because of the global crisis, we did see the fact that hot money, the reliance on foreign investors was there. We still have an, an important aspect of building our domestic regulators. How do we do that? How do we also build the domestic investors? And it is important that we work um, again in a coordinated manner uh, with the other sectors to ensure that we build a domestic investor base. And that's uh, uh, that's what we have focused on. Um, let's go to you, Fuller Daniel, talking about the role of insurers in all of this. I mean, I, as you admitted earlier on, it's really just a question of working in tandem with other regulators and coming up with, with products that are attractive. Are Nigerian savers, are they people who are interested in coming up with new measures of investing their money, looking to the insurance industry as providing an avenue? Yeah, Th thank you. The, the insurance industry it's not performing optimally. And I told you earlier, because the insurance industry had concentrated uh, on the mid middle class uh, workers, Nigerian workers, essentially the former sector. But we have seen the need really to go beyond the former sector. But the reason, one of the major constraints to growth of insurance is that of products. We've sold policies or products that are tailor-made from Europe and America. And it's, for some time it worked. It was OK, but it's no longer working because really the insurance industry is working where we should be running. So one of the things we've seen is that the need to come up with products that are environmental friendly and environmental sensitive. Uh, the, 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 the products of insurance that is well known to every one of us, even the elites have objections. People cannot understand why they take a comprehensive motor insurance for 10 years and they continue to pay, there's no accident and nothing is returned to them. But we find an answer in Takafu insurance. The, 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 the tenets of risk management as enshrined insurance principles holds true for 
Takafu insurance. But the modality for administration of fund is different, and there are ways of assuaging even the worries of those who are taking conventional products. So it is uh, a way we are concentrating in, and uh, we are conducting diagnos diagnosis studies on Takafu and micro insurance, and we believe that in the next two, three years, more and more Nigerians will be taking these insurance products that we believe are people-friendly and we will get, uh, be able to achieve deepening of insurance penetration in our climate. Um, this whole issue of microinsurance, maybe it's just the ABCs, it needs to be explained to me. A lot of the regulation at the moment is focused on the banks and retail lending at that level, but there is a sense that um, not enough oversight on this side of the, the system, the micro lending system, and just ensuring that on this part of the market, the segment of the market, you really have serious monitoring and, and, and um, you know, monitoring mechanisms just to ensure that people are protected. Actually, I was going to address uh, two issues. One uh, relating to uh, what the Commissioner of Insurance talked about, about having products that allow us uh, to bring on board uh, those who have uh, excluded fin from the financial system. Uh, and also just uh, to respond to your earlier point about liquidity. Uh, we do believe that collective investment schemes for Nigeria are extremely important. Today, we have under 250,000 investors in collective investment schemes. Yet, we have a population which I'm told is 167 million, 168 million people. So there's a potential to address that area. We believe that some of the, uh, some of the reasons that, are, that the retail investors uh, really felt the crisis in Nigeria was because they were investing themselves directly in individual stocks on our stock exchange. What collective investment schemes offer is an opportunity for the retail investors to diversify their investments. But what it offers us as a market is another opportunity to institutionalize our market. Because what you will see is that if we have many more collective investment schemes, they will address some of the challenges that we talked about earlier in terms of liquidity. Because liquidity is important if you're going to grow a market because it allows free entry or easy entry and, and, and easy exit. And if you have more institutional players, then it's easier for people to take positions in the market as well. So, so I do believe that the issue of collective investment schemes is extremely important, which is why we are, as SEC Nigeria have been very focused on first enhancing the regulatory framework on building capacity amongst fund managers, but we're also looking uh, in the next few years to develop the same kinds of disciplines that you have in the US and in the UK of investment advisors and financial planners, because we do think that's a clearly an area of growth in our market. All right, on that tack, we're taking a short break and she's given us something to think about for when we come back after the break. It's also managing those fund managers and the role that they play in the developing market economy.